This organization is called Ratio Christi. We're an apologetics organization here on campus that comes from the Greek apologia, which means to give a defense. So what we're giving a defense for is the Christian faith, specifically historical, philosophical, and scientific reasons to believe in Jesus Christ specifically and the Christian God in general. Today we're actually going to be going over just the theistic God in general and good natural reasons for why you should believe a God exists. We are Think Theism specifically here at this branch. Our um, mother organization is called Ratio Christi Incorporated. Bit of a disclaimer, but my views are not necessarily those of Ratio Christi Incorporated, so do not blame our overlords for anything that I say that you find offensive. But you can, of course, blame me. I will take it. Another disclaimer, this presentation is going to be based largely on the book, How Reason Can Lead to God by Joshua Rasmussen. Since there is a book involved, the pre presentation will never be as good as the book. That's just, you know, a reality of life. But you can, of course, consult the book if you're really interested in one of the topics I bring up for a lot of a more deep explanation of some of the things we go over. And we will be going over a lot today, so don't uh, be afraid if you kind of get confused or lost. There's a lot of thinking that goes into this topic because this is kind of like all of natural theology in a broad brush. So specifically what we're going to be going over today is what's called the bridge of reason. We're going to start by thinking about what exists, and we're going to try to figure out fundamentally why it exists. Why does anything exist at all? Why is there nothing, or something rather than nothing? Uh, we're going to use that kind of puzzle of existence to infer a theory about reality, which we're going to call the foundation theory. We're going to learn how this foundation has eternal power, pure actuality, and then we're going to learn how this foundation provides a better, al better alternative than materialism for things like mind, matter, morality, and math and logical reasoning. And from that, we're going to really put together something about a treasure about this foundation that actually is really important, I think, to you and to us as we live as human beings on planet Earth. So let's start with what exists. I want you to imagine everything that exists in your mind. If you're an atheist, imagine just you know whatever you think exists. If you're a theist, imagine uh, aphysical things as well. Everything exists. I want you to imagine it, and you're going to put it into a blob of everything. So there's our blob. It's got everything in it. Now, what can we reason about this blob? Well, by definition, we know that the blob of everything includes all that exists. That's how we've set this up. If you're mathematically inclined, it is the set of everything, right? That means that there's no existing thing outside this blob of everything. And that means there's no existing cause outside the blob of everything. Because we all know that something exists to actually cause other things. I have to exist before I could bring a drawing into life, for example. Therefore, there is no existing cause outside the blob of everything that caused it to exist. Now, at first, Vivlash, of course, is nice and solid. This is logical and reasonable. But it's kind of weird. Because everything we typically see in life be it happiness, or um, a dog, or a cat, or rain. It has a cause. These things that we see actually have some sort of reason for their existence. They aren't just, you know, always there, never before disappeared. That doesn't actually make any sense, does it? They're not uh, ki the kinds of things that are um, self-sufficient or uncaused. But we know that fundamentally, there's something in this blob of everything that is because there's nothing outside of the blob of everything that could cause it. You guys all following with me so far? Great. So how can anything have this self-sufficient property? What is this thing in the blob of everything, or is it the whole blob of everything that has this property? Well, we're going to start by dividing things in the blob of everything into two kind of categories, either independent things or dependent things. Please try to remember this distinction, because it is important going forward. Independent things don't depend on anything beyond themselves. They are this self-sufficient thing we're really looking for in the blob of everything. And then the dependent things are things that do depend on something else. They re rely on something external to themselves. They have causes. We know that a realm or the universe, all of everything, can't be self-sufficient without having some independent thing in it. Because independence is fundamentally the root of self-sufficiency. That's what the thing we're looking for. And we know from our previous argument that the blob of everything is a self-sufficient realm. So that means, again, that the blob of everything must have something in it that is an independent foundation. In other words, it's got shoes that it's standing on. There's something in their foundation that's lifting it up and keeping it supported. And we're going to call this thing the foundation. 
The world includes a foundation that stands on its own and provides the ultimate basis for all else. Whatever this thing is, and we haven't made exact you know, specifications of what this is yet, but whatever it is, we know it's not a dependent thing. That rules out typically things we think of of size, shape, or number, because things like that have causes. They um, have something that essentially uh, keeps them supported on their own. And we'll do some arguments to make sure that this is completely true. So we're going to update our picture now from the earlier comical version to our now more sophisticated theory of everything, as it were. So what do you guys think so far is strong about our bridge? And what do you think is weak about it? Any questions? Yeah. Um, at least theoretically problematic. Yeah. So actually, I will. I can bring up another slide that this is at the end to talk about this if you're still kind of confused at the end. But we will talk about that next. Yes. Uh, the bridge. I thought we were talking about a blob. The bridge is just our chain of reasoning so far, okay. or our argument. Yeah. It's a good thing to clarify that. Okay. So actually, to your kind of question, couldn't dependent parts add up to independent wholes? Couldn't we have a lot of dependent things, maybe just in succession, and get some sort of an independent whole? Well, in philosophy, we're going to call this a construction error. So just like you can't really take white tiles and add them together to make a black floor, it really doesn't make sense to take an independent thing and make it up of dependent parts, because an independent thing doesn't really have a cause, and a dependent thing does. So an actual argument to kind of prove this is from potentiality and actuality. Does, how many people know of that distinction? OK, so just to make it clear, a potential thing is something that has to be brought into ex existence. For example, a drawing has to be brought into existence by myself, or a pencil has to be brought into existence by people. Um, a actual thing is something that's already in existence. So something like you or me, we're actual things. A potential reality is only actual if something out actualizes it. So something that has a cause is at least at some point in its life potential, and then it is caused and brought into actuality. If the totality of dependent realities lacks an actualizer, then nothing accounts for its actuality. And the totality would be merely potential. So if everything were just a series of dependent causes, then nothing would have been there to cause it in the or dependent things that need a cause, and nothing would have been there to cause them in the first place. We know that something is actual, or at least I think we can all safely assume that, right, for this moment. Which means that there is an actualizer somewhere with depend, um, of dependent realities with a necessary nature. This is sometimes called the unmoved mover argument, or the uncaused cause argument, if you're kind of interested in looking into that a little bit thor more thoroughly. So kind of another way, again, to frame it, if a giant Bob the Builder balloon potentially exists, we can only build it if there's an actualizer to bring it into existence. And that's true for all dependent things, including us, including matter, if matter is a dependent thing, and so on and so forth. So another question I think people typically bring up on things like this is, well, couldn't maybe um, things that are dependent all have come because one dependent thing came from nothing? So maybe a de dependent thing just kind of popped into existence from nothing. Well. This theory is actually a logical fallacy. It's called the law of non-contradiction. To kind of visualize it, we're going to imagine a unicorn, a very powerful, awesome, potential unicorn. If this very powerful, awesome, potential unicorn uses its mystical potential unicorn voodoo, which is still spelled wrong, sorry, people. Vodo. Vodo. It uses its Vodo to bring itself into actuality. Then we actually have a problem here, because this Unicorn had to have been actual to cause itself. Only actual things cause things. So it's been actual and not actual in the same time in the same sense, which is a problem. Another way to think of that is this, if that kind of contradiction doesn't readily come to your mind, is just if this is true, if we posit that things can just pop from potentiality into actuality on their own, then we should be seeing this today in the world. We should actually see this happen regularly. But those potential gnomes who have a beef with the unicorns have not showed up yet. So that's probably not a good theory to uh, be accepting into our worldview as a whole. Now, some people get a little bit more sophisticated with this idea. And they go, well, OK, 
maybe things can pop into nothing so long as the first thing that popped into nothing happened to say nothing else can pop into nothing. Because then we're good, right? Well, uh, the problem with this is that you've basically got a cage um, that you've left open, that you've left unlocked. So imagine, again, that in our potential world, our, um, something brings itself out of nothing into actuality. And the first rule it kind of brings is that you can't bring things into and out of, or into um, nothing. Well, the problem is that that rule has no grounding. There's no reason that that rule or that cage couldn't just disappear. So if the law that you can't bring things from potentiality to actuality can just come into actuality, then why can't it just disappear from actuality? And the moment it disappears from actuality, then potential things should still be popping into existence all over the place. And they're not. So we can pretty much rule out that for a foundation. And we're still left with this independent, self-sufficient something in all of everything that we need to account for. So now, how did the capacity to produce effects, or the uh, basically ability to be a cause, come to exist? Well, there are three options. The first is that it came from nothing. As our unicorn has demonstrated by now, that's really not a good idea. That's not a good option. The second option, which should, oh, there we go, is that something else caused it to come into existence. This is actually just as problematic as the first option, because that would entail something was actual prior to actuality existing. So that is also an issue. Then the third option is that it never came into existence, that power or the uh, capacity to produce causes has always been around. And that means it's part of the foundation. It's part of this independent something in the world. And it can't fail to exist. Now, how can actuality, or the state of being actual, or being itself, as it were, as a concept, exist at all? Well, it has the same three options as power. Either actuality makes itself actual, something other than actuality makes itself actual, or nothing makes actuality actual. It's been actual on its own, all the time, by necessity. And just like before, the first two options fail because they kind of violate that logical law. So we're left with the fact that actuality has always been a thing. There's some being that always has been. Something yes. Is. Something is eternal. Being, being itself, at least, is eternal, yes. So when we think about this, and now kind of as we've kind of summarized our reasoning, what we found out is that the foundation, this independent foundation in all of everything, isn't just the foundation for actual things. It's the foundation for all possible things. It can't be a merely potential thing. It is and must be actual. Who was the Descartes? previous? Uh, this is Descartes, yeah. but he is a AI Descartes, AI so that's Descartes. why he looks kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, my, my social skills are so bad that honestly he looks normal to me. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. And this is our uh, nice uh, book writer, so you can thank him for all the arguments. So one more thing we're kind of going to establish about the foundation is whether or not it can have limits. So. There's actually more of a sophisticated line of reasoning you can go through to get this, but it's like too many, too many premises even for uh, this talk. So let's just imagine for a moment that the foundation has some sort of a limit. It can make 32 particles. Just right off the bat, um, if you think about it, there's no real reason why the foundation should have this limit. I mean, why couldn't it make 35 or 37 particles? And in the fact, the more we think about limits and what they are, we realize that they're the kind of things that could be otherwise. Limits, it seems, are um, dependent entities. They're not like this independent thing. They actually could be other than they are. But we know from our previous line of reasoning that our foundation is an independent thing. And it can't be made of dependent parts. So the foundation can't have limits. Essentially, if you are to think of it in our picture there, everything and limiting things are kind of one thing. But they're not the foundation. The foundation is something separate that lifts and holds all of those things together. So what do we know so far about the foundation? Well, from reason alone, not from religion, not from anything else, we've kind of learned quite a few interesting things about the foundation. The first is that it's independent. The second is that it's necessary. It's eternal. It's not composed of dependent things. It's ultimate, or the root of all dependent things. It's pure actuality. It's all powerful, and it's without limits. This does look a lot like the theistic god, but again, we're trying to go from reason alone and no religious kind of supposition. 
So now, what else can we discover about the foundation by proving or probing the things that exist? And what else can the foundation kind of use um, to help us understand reality and what exists? Well, we're going to look at mind, matter, mathematics, and reason to try to figure that out. So let's first look and examine mind. What is mind? Well, a lot of philosophers have thought really hard about this topic for a long time. And yes, consciousness is really hard to pin down. But there are three kind of aspects that people think are critical to mind. The first is your feeling aspects of sensations. So your experiences of like mass, motion, and shape, you know, the material world, that aren't equal to mass, motion, and shape. So one good way to think about this is the um, thought experiment Mary the Color Scientist. Let's suppose that this girl Mary here has lived her life in a gray and white world. Gray, white, and black, I guess. Sure. Three colors. Gray, white, and black world. But she knows everything about the other colors. She knows exactly how light interacts with the eyes to bring forth color. She knows exactly how different molecules and chemicals absorb different um, quantas of energy to then shoot them back at her eyes and give you color. She knows everything about color. Is something different to Mary when she walks out of the colored black and white world that she's lived in into a world of color? Is there something radically different from between from her knowing about color, knowing everything about it materially, and actually experiencing color? Most people would say yes. And that's kind of the qualia of the mind, that you can't just pin down to matter, mass, and motion. Now, the next aspect is private access. So your feelings, your beliefs, your opinions, they're directly knowable to you, but they're not knowable to anybody else. A brain scientist just looking at your brain and random neurons firing does not know what you're privately thinking, feeling, or believing. It's private. Even though in the material world when big things and matter collide with one another, or they move, or they change shape, everything else in the material world kind of gets to experience it on a hands-on, very public way. And then the final um, problem of consciousness is free will. Most people are more familiar with this, or in other words, the power to choose. Of course, you can't deny any of these three, but they're what's considered the hard problem of consciousness. And essentially, it's a contradiction with what these things are and what um, we s um, would suppose they would be if material was all there was. So the first being qualia, how do you build first person sensations from non-sensing materials like location, mass, and movement? Second problem, how do you build, build private aspects from things that are purely public? And then the third problem would be, how do you build the power to choose from particles that inherently do not have a power of their own to make choices? I'm a chemist. I know that very well. At least I never assume they have choices. That would be really scary for my profession if I did. <laughs> nah, not, not quite yet. So has anybody heard some different theories or ideas to maybe solve this problem from a materialistic kind of point of view? Consciousness ain't real. Daniel a lot of people will deny consciousness. A lot of people don't like that, but that is definitely one way to go about it. Anything else? Okay. Yep. Well, one of my favorites is called emergentism, which kind of goes like this. Just like you have kind of water emerging from oxygen and hydrogen, maybe properties like consciousness can just emerge from material as you arrange it in the right um, configurations. And while this theory is really nice, it actually doesn't solve the problem. It just labels it. So to kind of see why this doesn't solve the problem, I want you to imagine that you see water coming out of a rock, just spewing forth from the rock itself. And you go and you say, well, to explain this water, I'm going to say the water emerged from the rock. Have you actually solved the problem? Not really. It's still a construction error, error because rock is the wrong sort of thing to have water come out of it. Water just by definition doesn't come out of rocks. That's not what rock is. It's not a source of water. And in the same way, saying that somehow you can take these non-sensing, non-free will, non-private, um, all public access materials and just get these um, traits that are uniquely contrary to them, it's a bit of an issue. Another question, and I think what you brought up is, yes, a lot of people either deny consciousness or they say, well, maybe there's some way that consciousness is reducible to matter. Uh, there actually is a lot of debate and discussion on this, and we've done a few videos on it in the past, so I would encourage you to actually look on our YouTube channel and look at our transhumanism um, discussion, because that kind of addresses it well. You can also consult the philosopher John Searle um, and look at through the Chinese room thought experiment, where they're essentially going to argue that no, um, it really seems like third-person aspects of molecules only com combine to form more complex third-person aspects of molecules. We've never seen this happen before. Why should we expect that it happens? Um, but I will encourage you, actually, for this 
particular topic since it's a bit more hairy to dive more into the literature. And talk to Julie here, who's like our resident expert on that topic. She did her PhD on it, so she knows. Now, if we suppose that our foundation has a mental characteristic, then it actually makes a lot of sense of these three hard problems. Because we can avoid the no nonsense to sense transition, we can avo avoid the public to private transition, and we can avoid the free will paradox. So it seems like our foundation for the mind does a really good job of solving this issue. As it were, it's a better hypothesis than the alternative. Yes? Yeah, but if I have a mind, then why is AI art so good? <laughs> Actually, you would be surprised at how often I've been thinking about that in the recent months. It is a, an interesting dilemma. AI art just won an art contest recently. It did. It's legit. So officially, it has now beat us in the artistic endeavors, which is interesting. Why didn't the programmers uh, win it? Why didn't the programmers win it? Uh, to be clear, this was a state fair. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a state fair, indeed. But I mean, you could say that AI art Well, good we, we know competitions are always, always rigged anyway. They're all always rigged. Anyway. So that's just one problem. Uh, now let's look to the problem of uh, matter, essentially. Uh, have you guys ever heard of fine-tuning problems? Things like that? OK. So fine-tuning problems are essentially problems that arise from the in design inherent in nature and the tuning of like scientific constants and scientific laws to be just so to get creation and matter to seem to be arranged to support life. This is just one typical example of that. But there are specific conditions that are required for life to exist. And there are random dials set to random set settings really shouldn't automatically produce a life sustainable universe. But this is kind of the assumption you have to work under if you're a materialist. A number of dials in our wor world are very precise for our existence. To turn any of them just slightly would result in annihilation. The foundation would actually predict these precise dials tuned in precise ways for life, rather than materialism. If you want to actually know what those are, here's just a classic thing to Google. Google Martin Rees and the cosmological constants. You'll find tons of constants, just a few different examples, mainly of the physics um, uh, constants that are fine-tuned for the existence of life. But you should know that there are about hundreds and hundreds of things that are claimed fine-tuned and gone into existence. So there's no shortage of discussion in this particular section of natural theology. Has anyone heard some proposals to maybe try to explain this? Yes? One would be that, OK, well, sure, our universe uh, has all of these constants, but like maybe there are infinite universes. And at some point, this would be, this is, would be bound to happen. And the only reason we're thinking, you know, the only reason we're able to think about this issue is because we got lucky and we're in the one universe that is, like the anthropic principle. Exactly. Yeah. So actually, we'll discuss two of those for kind of our two proposals. So the first one you threw up, which is great, is many universes. Actually, as we've laid this out so far, this proposal doesn't compete with the foundational mind hypothesis. The foundational mind is perfectly capable of making many universes. Our argument, in fact, of the blob of everything would apply even if you were envisioning that all of reality was a multiverse. So that in and of itself doesn't really touch our foundation. But multiplying the number of universes still fundamentally doesn't explain how one could contain life. To organize that's another way. Some people will argue, well, maybe uh, we just see fine tuning because we happen to exist. And so we exist, therefore we can observe it. So it's not that it's unique or special. It's just that we're the only fine tuned creatures out here able to observe it. Well, the problem with this is that it still, again, pushes that explanation back. So to kind of visualize this, here's a great ex thought experiment. Let's imagine there's a room full of poison, because we all love to poison people in rooms, right? Just me? Aw. OK, well, imagine there's a room full of poison, and you've got four people in the room. Three of them are dead, and the fourth is alive. Does that guy then just say, well, I'm alive just because. I'm alive to see myself alive. No. That's an incomplete explanation. And the same goes for this theory. It doesn't really answer what it means, needs to answer. It doesn't explain the phenomena we're trying to um, go for. But the foundation theory does. A lot of people also like to say, well, maybe it's just deeper physical laws than anything. Or some natural thing explains this, but it's better to say that it's a natural thing than to posit some sort of a foundational mind or some sort of a god, as you will. Well, um, yeah, you could say that both of those things are not inherently wrong. 
but they don't answer the question. It's just kind of begging the question or shoving it off as something that you don't answer. And in philosophy, we don't like to do that. In life, we don't like to do it. You don't want to base your entire theory of all that exists on, well, I just don't know. But if we try to really consider this foundational mind hypothesis, it makes a lot of sense. If we take all the fine-tuning data, all the design data, and we basically set up as two hypotheses. Either one, the foundation actually has the power to intend to form creatures, to set up matter in the material universe in the way that it is. Or the foundation doesn't have the power to intend this, but just sets these dials randomly. It just kind of happens randomly. Again, the data makes a lot of sense on the first hypothesis. But on the second si hypothesis, it's pretty unlikely because you're just kind of removing a power from the foundation for no apparent reason. And then you're even adding an arbitrary limit to your foundation. You're saying, well, the foundation can only do things randomly just because. And like we noticed before, arbitrary limits aren't really great to put in our foundation. It seems like the reason would suggest they aren't part of it. So now, uh, the last thing, or well, one of the last things, second to last, you're almost done. Uh, is morality. So we use our senses of the physical universe to learn about the world. Well, in the same way, we use our sense of goodness, badness, positivity, and negativity, rightness and wrongness, to try to tell us about the moral landscape, moral oughts or shoulds that we live with in our day, or good things or bad things, value. We can kind of call this the moral window hypothesis. And this comes up everywhere. So here's something from my old undergraduate institution, Colorado State University, where they're arguing that it's a moral argument to try to reintroduce wolves to Colorado, which personally I'm a fan of, but most people aren't. Um, it's actually not like a true philosophical moral argument, but you can see that they're making a moral claim and expecting people to understand it, that there is a rightness or wrongness about reintroducing wolves to Colorado for various reasons. So I actually am going to completely bounce on this entire topic because we're going to be doing two meetings of it on it later on in the semester, and they're gonna be much more thorough and deep Julie will be covering the history of this entire argument and chain of reasoning next meeting. And then we're going to have an awesome expert speaker, David Baggett, come to do a really deep philosophical discourse into this argument. So I would encourage you to come for that. But suffice it to say that their conclusion is going to be morality is explained really well by a foundational mind hypothesis, but really, really poorly on a materialistic one. And then the final thing we're going to look at for our examination today is mathematical and logical principles. They exist, where do they come from? Well, when we think about mathematics and logic, we notice that they have two kind of qualities. The first is size, it extends beyond your mind or your thoughts. So just because you can't understand a mathematical chain of reasoning or what some mathematical entities are, doesn't mean that they don't exist. They extend beyond your mind or your capacity to think them. And the second would be stability. The mathematical landscape is constant. So two plus two was the same yesterday as it is today, as it will be tomorrow, as it will be in I don't know, 3,652, if we ever get that far. That would be cool. So the foundation we've proposed, it seems to have these qualities. It seems to be unlimited, and it's necessary. It always exists. It's always like this. So grounding truths like this ha with their origin in this mental foundation is a really good idea. But let's go ahead and let's try to ground them in matter, in you know sizes, shapes, movements, locations. Can we even ground a triangle? that way. Fundamentally, I'm a chemist, so I like to look at things with like atoms, molecules, and stuff. And I know at the end of the day, if you get really, really small, there aren't any three straight edges stuck together like a triangle. You can't physically actually build the triangle. Like at the end of the day, if you go into the graphite and all the different molecules, you don't have a triangle. But we do know triangles, of course, exist. We know that they have 180 degrees internally, even if they don't exist at the atomic level. So it's kind of weird and kind of worrying that the natural shapes and things that make up our universe can't even make up a triangle, but we know 100% that it exists. Um, and we notice like shapes, sizes, these are insufficient materials to construct the thought-like nature of math and logic. A mental reality, a mental foundation would not be. And if we take particles and we arrange them into shapes and sizes and just try to place them in different locations, do we get things that are about things in the same way that mathematics and, and logic is? Not really. Our triangles aren't about anything in that way. So a quick recap, what have we gone over? We've learned a lot of things about our foundation in the beginning of this talk. It's independent, necessary, eternal, not composed of dependent things, ultimate, pure actuality, all powerful, without and limits. And now in this end part of the talk, a lot of those arguments need to be fleshed out more. They need more detail, more discussion on both sides. 
But we know that the foundation seems like it's a good source for valuable things like math, reason, mind, matter, and morality. So let's conclude with a treasure. We know that the foundation has these valuable qualities like mentality, morality, reason, power. We know that the foundation lacks arbitrary limits. And whatever has valuable qualities without limit, it has a supreme nature. You can think of it as all perfect. That means that the foundation has a supreme nature. It is the best mentality, the best morality, the best reason, the best matter, if you want to think of it that way. It's a source of all good things. It's perfect. It's got the supreme nature. This is a pretty incredible thing, and we've gone to it with just our minds alone. We're not bringing in any religious supplications or anything like that. This is just what we see when we think about what exists. So kind of to summarize this talk, within you is a window into many things, the trace of the foundation of all things. And I encourage you all to think about this as you go on and to re maybe watch this talk on YouTube and think about it some more and to dive into these arguments, because natural theology is a pretty cool area. How do you want to do that? Well, the book by Joshua Rasmussen, How God Can Lead to Re Reason, he typed it, the title wrong. I don't know why they did this. It's, it goes backwards. But it's, yeah, it's supposed to be stairs. Yeah, I don't know. I don't like it. Anyway, great book. Highly recommend. The On Guard series by William Lane Craig, also a great book to start diving into natural theology. The Defenders podcast by William Lane Craig. And then our YouTube channel, we've gone into a lot of these stuff. We'll be going into more in the future future as well, so I'd always consult that for some great videos. If you want to just dive ho hardcore, go into the Blackwell Companion for Natural Theology. But read these first, just to save yourself pain. Okay, that's it. Please sign in the QR code, tell us what you thought.